Thank you for having me here. It feels really good to be in this room. Um, before I start, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to Nakima. Um, it was a beautiful talk, and it's not easy to go first. And I mean that on more than one level. So uh, thank you so much. It was, it was really a beautiful talk. OK, so. I got the clicker now, and I came here to meet 10 black people, is the title of my talk. So um, I'm going to stand on the shoulders of a giant for a moment and just start off with this quote uh, from Toni Morrison and just say that the very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. Somebody says you have no language, and you spend, <clears throat> so you spend 20 years proving that you do. Somebody says your head isn't shaped properly, and so you have scientists working on the fact that it is. Uh, somebody says you have no art, so you dredge that up. Somebody says you have no kingdom, so you dredge that up. None of this is necessary. So I'm um, gonna move ahead and um, just explain why I give this talk. It changes a little time, a little bit every time that I get up and see who's in the room. It kind of shifts around a little bit. But the genesis of this talk is uh, just a really small anecdote. I went to an event that I had a badge for and I was in, you know, invited to be there. And every time I went to enter the venue, I was stopped because people didn't believe that I belonged there. And people around me would be going in, and people, their badges weren't being checked, they weren't being stopped, nobody was asking them why they were there. And it didn't feel great. And so I said to myself, well, that's their problem, because I obviously do belong here. I have a badge. And I'm not going to be defined by the ignorance and assumptions of people who think that they know something about me because they're incorrect. And more to the point, not only do I belong here, but so do other people like me, and I'm gonna find them. So I said to myself, you know what, I'm gonna get past this annoying person, again, <laughs> and I'm going to go in, I'm gonna find 10 black people. This is my goal for the week, I'm gonna find 10 black people. So. The question is, once you've made it in tech, uh, what happens then? The answer is, set a goal, 10 black people. Uh, why 10? 10 is the smallest big number, right? So it seems like you should easily be able to find 10 black people. Uh, and when you go to do it, many times you find actually it's kind of a big number. And, um, and it's also really weird. So I found it to be a really disarming thing that I would just go up to people and say like, hey, how you doing? Like, I'm here to meet 10 black people. And they're like, wow, that's specific. <laughs> and then they'd be like, yeah, 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 I'm gonna help you out, yeah, I'm gonna find, and then they'd look around the room and it's like, ah. Uh... And sometimes what else will happen was that people really get into the project and they'll take you by the hand and drag you across the room and find 10 black people. So um, it, it can play out in a variety of ways. Um, and that sort of begs the question, if it's so hard to find 10 black people, like why do I even wanna be here? People do ask that, why tech anyway? And I would say that um, tech is awesome. It offers a lot of things. It offers security. It offers prestige. It offers an intellectual challenge. I like to solve interesting problems, and I think that's true of a lot of black people. Um, and also, this is a huge motivator for people of color. It offers the chance to build generational wealth. And many of us have come from backgrounds and heritages where that was withheld. And we want to pass things down to our children. 
We want to pass things up to our parents, to our grandparents. We want to help our extended families. We want to build assets. And tech offers a route to all of those things. But once you get there, it can be rough. So uh, what you will find if you come from a background in which opportunity has been withheld is what I call, it's an experience that I call the bends. When people are under deep sea pressure and come up too fast, it can, it can lead to a physical stress. And in the same way, when you have come from a background in which opportunity has been withheld and suddenly come up, and some of that pressure is released, and you're making more money, and you have a good job title, uh, there's a sense of disorientation that can come along with that. You're suddenly surrounded by people who take a certain type of entitlement for granted. Um, they have been immersed in it their entire lives. They don't question it because they can't see it. And it can feel really strange to come into that environment. You're around people that are strangely weird and cold sometimes. They have certain assumptions and practices that you didn't grow up with. And there's this sense of cognitive dissonance that comes along with that. Additionally, when you are coming into the situation, and particularly if you're self-taught, it's easy to feel imposter syndrome. And I think right now there's a fetish for imposter syndrome. You see so many articles that just assume that you have it. Of course you've got imposter syndrome. Of course you feel like you don't belong here. And you're always gonna feel that way. And I think that's not true. I think you do reach a level of proficiency where you don't feel like an imposter anymore and you do know that you earned your place. But the people around you don't think that. So there's this cognitive dissonance between an imposter syndrome that you've shed and grown out of, but maybe other people think you're an imposter. So it can be really hard to arrive at a sense of self-esteem that is both healthy and reality-based. Um, the amount of code switching that you need to do to go between your roots and then go to your job at work uh, can, it can be very hard to navigate those different, uh, those different spheres while still feeling like you're being true to yourself. And you don't ever want to lose that sense of truth. You don't ever want to lose that sense of who you are. And ultimately, you are the single source of truth for who you are. Nobody can tell you, and nobody can put it on you. They can try but you know who you are. Um, the situated experience of being the first and being the only, it can be highly stressful, as I just said. I am in my third decade of tech. So I've been doing this a long time. And um, probably what you're thinking right now is she looks great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding, but um, but it it is sometimes very stressful to be the first and to be the only, and then what happens is that you have to cobble it together yourself. Come on, honey, go forward, and you're forced to resort to these ad hoc techniques of coping, which is inefficient. Why should you have to reinvent the wheel every time? But frequently, that's what happens. Here are some of my techniques, love. It can be really hard to love yourself as you're going through this. Really hard, really dispiriting, really discouraging. And if you have those moments where you're having trouble accessing that love for yourself, I love you. You don't know me, but I love you. And there are, there are people out there who, who would understand you if they knew you, you can try and make it your mission to find them, and frequently they will find you. And I'm hoping that in this talk, if you're looking around and you're feeling that way and you see that spark in somebody's eye, make a connection, talk to them, come find me afterward. Nothing exists in a vacuum. And we hear all this talk all the time about how tech is special. It's not. There's nothing special about tech. Tech is made by people, 
And people, when they go to their jobs, act like who they are, and they act the way that they act the rest of the time in this world. And when you, when you uh, are dealing with people, you need to remember that companies are people in the same way that tech is people. And the reason that companies have a problem with diversity is because the world has a problem with diversity. And that's actually good news. If you have professional accountability, you can ask yourself, what are you complicit in? What are you holding up? Where are your blind spots? And what are you acquiring as you climb this ladder? Are you forgetting that access and uh, a free ticket are not the same thing, as Nakima said? Are you forgetting that something as simple as bus fare can prevent someone from making it to an event like this, even though there's no charge? There are a lot of really small things that you can do, and you can help to shore each other up. And that leads to personal accountability, because companies are people, and tech is people, and we are people. We're humans with each other. What can you do as a human to and for your fellow humans to make the world closer to what you think it ought to be? What can you do to make tech closer to what you think it ought to be? When you change the spaces in which we work, you actually change the society we live in. And that's why I said it's good news that people act at work the way that they do every place else. Because you have the option to bring this in. And everything in society has the ability to change. So leaderboard time. I came here to meet 10 black people. I got two, <laughs> Catherine and Jermaine. Hey, Jermaine. Um, if you would like to be on my list, come and find me. I will be on yours if you'll be on mine. And I also would like to um, boost the signal for Peter Banjo, who's a London friend that I made at MongoDB London. Uh, he has a friend who is looking to get into IT and networking. If anybody has an opportunity in London, this is how you can boost the signal. Like it's, it's just as easy as putting one sentence on a slide. If you know someone in London who is hiring for an entry-level position in IT or networking, please come find me. I'll put you in touch with each other. Thank you. <laughs>